to us today. Turn to Matthew chapter 8, verse 26 to 27. Y'all okay this morning? Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 26 to 27. You say amen when you got it. Verse 26 reads, this is Jesus talking to them as they were on the boat. And he saith unto them, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? You know, he said that because they're on a boat. There's a storm that's tossing the boat all around. And they, they're trying to bail water to keep from drowning. And Jesus looked at him and said, why are you scared for? <laughs> o ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now I want to take you to the prophecy of that in Psalms 107. For those of you that have Bibles, I'll wait. I hear pages turning. Psalms 107. You guys know what the Psalms are? They're Psalms. It's like the hymn, hymnal book of the Bible. So in the Old Testament, when they had a celebration, a lot of times they would sing some of these psalms that we read about. Most of them were written by David, but not all of them. And also they are prophetic, meaning that when he was writing these things, a lot of these things were prophetic, talking about future stuff. Isn't that amazing how music and the prophecy enters in the same mix? Amen. Psalms 107, verse 28. He says, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. I want you, the Lord, to come into this place today and make your storm calm. Tell the waves to stand still. Verse 30, then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Today, I want to minister to you from this topic, my help in the storm. My help in the storm. Come on, let's pray and let, let God have his way in this place. We want to open up our hearts and minds just to receive a word today. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord God, for your love and your mercy and your kindness, Lord. I thank you that your presence is here among us, Lord God, and I pray that your glory would come down. Father, I pray this morning that every heart would be open today, Lord, that there would not be a stony or hardened heart in this place. But, God, we avail ourselves to your spirit today, Lord God, that you would transform us, Lord God, that you would speak to us, Lord God, that you would help us today, Lord God, that we could meet you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, as I preach that you pour out salvation, Lord, that you would pour out deliverance, O oh God, let healing be found in this place this morning, oh God. Mental healing, physical healing, emotional healing. Father, I pray that you pour it out, oh God. We know today that you love us, oh God. We're here to serve you, Lord God, and for your will to be done. So we surrender this service this morning, Lord, praying that you have your way. I pray, Father, that you get the glory, you get the honor, you get the praise. In Jesus' name, somebody said amen. Turn to your neighbor and tap on the shoulder and say, my help is in the storm. <laughs> you ever been to the church where they, you can be seated. You ever been to the church where they didn't say that? You know why preachers say that? Just to get y'all involved. Amen. That's it. It's just a trick. Now I've exposed it. <laughs> That's it. There's no meaning behind that. There's, we just sick of the only ones doing the work. So we say, turn to your neighbor. Slap him on the head five times. And say you owe me money. <laughs> Lord, help us. <laughs> oh gosh, help us, Lord. How many of you have had problems since you've been going for God? Amen. Raise your hand. Go ahead, testify. If you've had a problem since trying to live for God, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. You ain't had no problems. You good. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to mess with you, bro. If you're good, I'm trying to, I need to talk with you after service, though. <laughs> Just so you do an interview. We have found the second coming of Christ. Praise God. 
I'm just messing with you, man. Don't, don't, don't be mad at me. <laughs> we have problems living for God. And it's amazing because pretty much everybody raised their hand. And those of you that didn't raise your hand, you just, you know, just, just not, that's not your personality. I understand that. But all of us do. But all of us also front like we don't. And we, we just kind of, hey, how you doing, bro? I'm good. I'm like, yeah. You know, and, and, and somehow or another, there's this illusion that you will have no problems. You know, uh, anybody believe that? Well, you know, once I get saved, there will be nothing going on. No, no. You know, it's true that God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's true that we were not a people, but are now the people of God. It's true that he's given us power, John said, to become the sons of God. So really what we're in is a process. We're in a process of transformation. <coughs> it's the same process that Jeremiah would prophesy about a, pot, a piece of clay on a potter's wheel. That's you. You're the clay. And you're going around that wheel in a circle. You go through what we call seasons. You know, and, you know, and, and then there's a, there's a master that's got his hands on this marred lump of clay, and it's pressing you. And when you, every rotation you go around, you know, something is, pressure gets put on one side of you. And it's going to shift you up. You know, that's amazing. If you've ever, I wonder how they do it. They take a little fat lump of clay, and they'll press it, and all of a sudden, it's a skinny lump, but it's tall. So, whoo, they'll just bring it up and put their thumb in there. You ever seen people do that? It's amazing. And God told Jeremiah to go to a guy, watch him do that, and said, that's y'all. You're that lump of clay. You're that lump of clay. And that, that, that hurts if you're the clay. If you're the master, it's fine because you know what you're doing. But if you're the clay, that's a rough process because you don't even know what the end product is. All you feel is the pressure forcing you in a different direction, conforming you into a different shape. And you're saying, I don't like this transformation. This is not who I am. Anybody ever said, this is not who I am? That's the whole point. God is transforming you and molding you and shaping you into what he wants you to be. We quote this scripture all the time. Paul said, all things work together for good. Some of y'all probably quote it. To them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. The next verse says, them who he called, he also predestined to be conformed. So if you're called and chosen of God, God is going to mold you. God is going to shape you. And you can't mold or shape anybody without pressure being added to the thing that you're trying to shape. All of us play with Play-Doh. You know what I'm talking about. Amen. And we would like to think that, Lord, can't you bless me and shape me at the same time? <laughs> but here's a, here's a controversial truth that I've learned. Blessing doesn't change you. It only magnifies what's already there. That's why Jesus could say, he that's been faithful in few, I'll make him ruler over many. You look at what's already there, you add more onto it, what's already there is just going to be magnified. But in order to be changed, it takes pressure. It takes some uncomfortable situations. It takes some things that I would rather not have to suffer. That I would rather not have to go through. Now, don't get, don't get it twisted. Serving God is much better than it was living, for, living in the world. Amen. Much better. Much, much, much better. Uh, praise God. Praise God. Because on my worst day, even if I were to die today, I'm still going to see Jesus in glory. I get hit by a car. It is what it is. I'm going to see the Lord. Something happens, I get sick and die. Oh, well, I'm still going to see the Lord. Amen. That, and that's, that's the worst case scenario right there is death for, for us. But God has made it to where our worst case is actually our best case. Because he's the one that has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So death is not even a sting to us. That's why we don't have to live in fear because not even death can hold us down. Death just means we get to go meet Christ. And then one day he's going to give us a new body that we don't have. We'll never die again. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'll take that over the bar any day. I'll take that over promiscuity any day. I'll take that over every addiction, all the fun of the world. I'll take that any day. 
I would rather be miserable in the house of God and know that at the end of the day, my suffering will lead to glory in Christ than to be having a ball out there in the world and bust hell wide open. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world, Jesus said, and lose his own soul? So I'm not going to complain to the point where I want to go back living in the world. No, friend, I'm not doing that. No way. No, sir. But just because we are saved doesn't mean we won't go through storms. Doesn't mean that God won't put a little pressure on your life every now and again. Doesn't mean that he won't put his hands up on you because he sees what you are right now and he has a destination for you, what he wants you to be. And he's got to put his hands up on you and pressure to mold you and to shape you to get you there. Praise God. So we can't curse these times. We can't look negatively upon them. What we've got to do is find our help in the storm. We've got to find the purpose, the reason for the storm. We've got to find the, the end goal and that will help us to go through it. We can't run from this. Some of you are in it right now. And the issue is, is if we take the wrong approach, we may not make it through it. But I want to minister to you today to tell you that there is help in the storm. Now, I'm going to say something probably controversial, but I'm going to tell you the storms are coming regardless. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. We have to pay attention to how Jesus presents things. It's very simple. Jesus didn't talk down to anybody, but for those who were listening, he, he made things very plain and simple for them. He said in verse 24 of the seventh chapter of Matthew, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Everybody say, doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon what? A rock. If you don't do anything, all the preaching in the world will not help you. You could come to every service we offer throughout the week, but if you don't do anything, it's not going to profit you anything. Hello, somebody. So we do the things that Jesus said. And we build our house, but this house is built on a rock. Verse 29, 25. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto what? Foolish man. So if you are hearing the word of God, if you are getting wisdom and sound instruction, and it's just kind of going in one ear and out the other, the Lord is calling you a foolish man, which builds a house, the Bible says, up on sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat up on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What this story teaches us, first of all, the principle that's obvious is that what Jesus is saying we must do. And we must have our house, the things that we're building, the choices that we make must be upon the right foundation. And that foundation is not easy to build upon. It's a rock. If you ever try to build on a rock, you know it's tough. You, you need a jackhammer. You need some heavy, heavy duty tools to break up that rock and put a foundation in that rock. But if you've ever tried to build a sand, you can do it with a plastic bucket and shovel right down here at the beach. You don't need much to build on that sand. It's very easy going. You just do whatever you want to do, and you can build whatever little sand castle you can come. But the news is, is that the revelation is that the storm is coming regardless. See, it doesn't matter. You could be living for God in every way that you know possible, and the storm's still going to come. You could be messing up and not doing anything that you were told to do from the scriptures or from the word of God or from the spirit of God, and the storm is still going to come. Because the storm is really a sifting. It's going to see which ones are standing and which ones fall. You can fake it all you want to when we come to meet on Sundays and Wednesdays or however when we meet, but eventually the storm is going to come, and you're going to be made well aware of what foundation you built your house upon, depending upon whether or not it's standing when the storm is gone. The storm is going to come regardless. We can't escape it. We can't hide from it. We cannot run from it. It's not going to feel good. It's going to beat up on my house. It's going to beat up on your house. I, some people think the pastors don't go through anything. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. The same storm that comes to your house, it comes to my house. The same affliction that comes to your kids, it comes to my kids. 
The same sicknesses that comes up on your family comes in my family. The same financial problems that you face, I'm face, probably at a greater level. The devil wants to take me out, greater he wants to take you out. Kill the shepherd and the sheep scatter. That's what the Bible says. So it's even hiding, praise God. And you think, well, man, I have some special ability to get up here every Sunday morning and minister to you out of the word of God. There's no special ability. It's all right here in the word of God. The house is founded and built up on something. And I've had to learn that it's not based off of my strength or my power or my ability. It's all based off of the Lord God that called me here. Praise God. And I'm telling you here today, if you will do what you know, hear the word of God and do the word of God, then you will begin to build something in your life that will give you longevity, something that will give you consistency, something that will give you faithfulness, something where you can have some safety. Praise God. That's where you find safety in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Some place of refuge. Hallelujah. Something that the world can't take away. See, I've got something and found something that no storm can take away. No problem can take away. No sickness can come up on. No amount of depression can take away my connection with Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. So I could be going through hell and high water, but if I can just find Jesus, praise God, I'll know that my house will continue to stand because I can't build it up on my own intellect. I can't build it up on what I think is best. I've got to adhere to the word of God because that storm is going to come regardless. And it turns out that the storm comes really to mold us. It comes to shape us. It comes to show us who we really are. Stand the test of time when some of the worst times come down your path. Will you still praise and lift up the Lord? Will you still worship and magnify God? There are many people in your Bible that suffered a storm, but probably none is, none is more impactful as Job. It's spelled Job, but its name pronounced Job. It's in the Old Testament. Now, Job is a poetic book, but really the first few chapters of Job is Job going through the worst storm that I've ever seen anybody go through. He's just living for God, doing his thing, doing all that he knows to do. The Bible says he was a righteous man and escheweth evil. I love that part. He escheweth evil. And then the devil comes up before the meeting in heaven, before God. And, and God looks at the devil and says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man in all the earth and escheweth evil. And the devil's response was this. Yeah, I know about him. He only served you because you put a hedge around him. You got a hedge, which shows us that serving God, God will put a hedge around you. He'll protect your children. He'll protect your livelihood, your career. He'll keep your finance. Come on, somebody. He'll keep your health. Oh, gee. We put a lot of stock in the healing power of God. We need to talk about the keeping power of God. God will keep you just as good as he can heal you. Ain't no telling. Eternity will tell how many diseases God kept us from. While we worried about the cold and headache we got, God's like, you talking about, I kept cancer away from you? <laughs> I kept this away from I kept that away from you? You never know. Your consistency and faithful from God, God is keeping stuff away from you. Plagues that he's sitting up on earth, he keeping away from us. <laughs> well, that was like, oh, he only serves you because you got a hedge of protection around him. That's why he serves you. But you remove that protection and he'll curse you to your face. God's like, oh, you think so? Job's not in this conversation. This is you. You have no idea. You're just living for God the best way you can, bro, trying to make ends meet, doing what you can, praying over your children like he was doing and all that. I want to keep everybody safe. And God's having a conversation and brought your name up. So, oh, yeah, you think he'll curse me? Go ahead and try it. He removed the protection around Job. God removed the protection. Oh, God removed his protection and allowed the devil to come in and touch his family, his finances, his career, his livelihood, everything. Only thing he couldn't touch the first time was his health. He said, don't kill him. Don't touch him. So in one day, family's having a party. His kids are having a party. And the house falls in and kills them all. Burn up. In one day, all of his flocks, donkeys, and herds are all gone. Burnt up. His livelihood is gone. He removes it all from him. All of his kids are dead. How would you react if all of your children died in one day? And you lost your job in the same day? And all of your stocks and 401k and retirement plans crashed in one day? And the only way you find out, because the devil left a messenger alive to tell you about it. How would you respond? What would you do? That, that's, a, that's, that's a mighty storm right there. That's some strong winds in that storm. 
some heavy flood waters in that storm. But ain't no running from that storm. Praise God. What do you do? Here's what Job did. The Bible says he ripped his clothes, fell on his face, and began to worship God. Began to worship God. See, there's something in a, in, a, in a person that has their mind made up that I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. Whether I'm sick, I'm going to bless him. Whether I'm hurting, I'm going to bless him. If I'm broke, I'm still going to bless him. If I'm without, I'm going to bless him. If I'm hungry, I'm going to bless him. If I'm depressed, I'm still going to bless, bless him. Matter of fact, if you're depressed, that's the easiest way to come out of that thing. You should just have a good old-fashioned praise and worship session to begin to lift up. Some of y'all were praising and worship this morning because you had to. This past week and month, there's been so much hell on earth that you just had to come into the... Oh, praise God. I will bless him. I will bless him. I will bless him. I will bless him at all times. Because my commitment and devotion to God is not predicated upon what he gives me and upon what he does for me. It's because I love him. And if I love God, I've got to be prepared to receive from God and also have things taken away from God. He says he fell on his face and began to worship. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. If that wasn't enough, there was another storm. The second chapter. I'm not reading it today. It's not even in my notes, but I'm just going with the Holy Ghost. Chapter number two, the devil comes back to God. God's like, yeah, I told you, right? Yeah, I told you he wasn't budget. That's my dude right there. That's my guy. The devil's like, yeah. You wouldn't let me touch his body, though. See, that's what the enemy is. He's a tempter and the accuser. He's playing both ends of the spectrum. He'll tempt you, and then when you fail, accuse you before God. So he went down there and tempted Job to curse God, and it didn't work. He comes back in God's face like, you didn't let me touch his body. That's what he worships, himself. <laughs> but we have a lot of self-worship these days. People that think they're their own God. We can take pictures of ourselves, call them selfies. Lovers of self, more than lovers of, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of. I'm not talking about yourself. Yeah, I take them too. Don't trip. <laughs> Just presenting a point. He said, if I can touch his body, then he'll curse you. So God's like, all right, fine, just don't kill him. What you mean? Don't kill him. Yeah, don't kill him. So he goes out and afflicts Job's body with boils. You ever seen those? I would say Google it, but it's kind of gross. They're, they're liquid-filled legions on the skin. And the Bible said him, they had, him and his wife had to scrape them off of his body. Can you imagine poor wifey <sighs> sitting beside you? Forget shaving his back. You're shaving pus-filled boils, you know. Couldn't kill him, though. Here's a revelation in the storm. It has limits. What you're going through right now has a limit to it. It can't go past that. Can't go past it. God has set the parameters. It can't go past that. Once it hits the parameters, it's got to stop there. It might hurt a little bit, but it can't go past a particular point. You can afflict him, but you cannot kill him. And then if that wasn't bad enough, his own wife, whom I'm imagining, this is not in the Bible, but probably presently scraping boils off of his flesh, turns to Job and says, why don't you just curse God and die? It's very interesting because she said the same thing the devil was trying to get him to do. Curse God and die, she said. And Job said, I don't recommend this, husbands. You can only say this to your wife if you have lost all your kids, all your livelihood, all of your bank and stocks account in 401k, and then you have presently scraping boils off of your flesh. If you go through that, then you're allowed to say what Job said to his wife. Otherwise, I do free marital counseling. <laughs> Job looked back at his wife and said, you speak like a foolish woman. 
which is true. Shoot, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> that's why you can say something you can't say. You can say that, but just, you know, you need a place to stay. I'm, I'll, I'll rent my couch to you. <laughs> <coughs> you speak like a foolish woman. Shall we receive blessing from the Lord and not be able to receive this curse? What he said? He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Now, if I came up here today and said, oh, I got a giving message. God is, a, and you know, we put the preacher in it. God is about to give you a, a blessing that you have not room to receive. And God is about to give you a promotion. And, and God is about to just turn around once and slap your neighbor on the five and say, God got a check coming for me. And, oh, we'd be shouting. Praise God. Look, somebody about to shout right now. We'd be running the aisle like, Pastor, you sure that word ain't in there? Hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, his blessings are going to overtake you. Goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Oh, we'll preach all of that. Praise God. I never heard one preacher come up and preach a taking message. God's getting ready to take some stuff from you. God's getting ready to take some comfort from you. God's getting ready to take convenience from you. God's getting, oh Jesus. God's getting ready to take family members from you. God's getting ready to take money from you. He does them both. Because you don't learn anything when the blessing comes. You learn about God and yourself when he takes stuff. Let me see if you'll still praise me. Let me see if you'll still worship me. Let me see what foundation you're built upon. Let me see where your love really lies at. Let me see where your heart really is. Where's your treasure really? Can I touch your treasure? Can I touch your heart? Praise God. Can I touch your time? Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, praise God. God delivered Job out of that storm. Took Job through many, many chapters of ups and downs. Even his friends was like, yo, bro, you must have done something bad. Because nah, this don't happen to people that serve God. And Job ended up having to pray for his friends. And God had to deal with Job. And Job got a bad spirit about him. And started, started complaining. And God had to ch call Job. He had to check him. You read the end of Job. God looked at Job and said, oh, Job, get up. He said, equip yourself like a man. I want to ask you some questions. <laughs> God told Job, stop crying and get up and talk to me like a man. Man, that's what we got to go through sometimes. <laughs> we just got to get up. He said, were you there when I found the disease? He said, where were you when I stretched the stars out in the heavens? <laughs> were you there when I pulled the dry land from the waters? He went through all of creation and said, Joe, where were you? Oh, you wasn't there? Oh, I forgot. You wasn't there. I'm God, huh? I'm God. I'm going to give you a revelation. If you're going through the storm, know this. God does not respond to your pity. Because Job's sitting there sucking his thumb. Woe is me. I lost my kids. I lost my house. I lost my family. I lost my livelihood. Even my friends are talking about me. My wife then turned on me. Woe is me. God don't respond to that. God doesn't respond to that. You begin to feel hopeless. You know who responds to hopelessness? The devil. Because he's hopeless. So you sink into depression. You think there's nobody on your side. You think there's nobody with you. You think that God has forsaken you. God has not gone anywhere. What he responds to is faith. He responds to faith. We can see this in the scriptures. The disciples, he put them in the storm. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they sent the multitude away, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat unto the ship so that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship asleep in a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master... Carest thou not that we perish? <laughs> and he arose. Jesus got up. This is a true story. They're going in a boat, and a storm comes as they're in the boat. And Jesus, during the storm, is asleep. And they had to wake Jesus up. And look at what they woke him up with. Don't you care not that we perish? There's a little bit of attitude in that. A little bit of unbelief. 
And so Jesus gets up, goes out to the edge of the boat. And the Bible says he speaks. He rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He didn't say, oh, oh baby, come here. I know it's going to be okay. Just. He said, why are you so scared? Where's your faith at? And the Bible says they responded and feared exceedingly and said one to another. What manner of man is this? Even the wind and the sea obeys him. So they found themselves in a storm. And the purpose of the storm was not to kill them. The purpose of the storm was not to bring them to their demise. The purpose of the storm was actually to reveal where their faith lied. And their attitudes lied. Because when the wind beat up on the ship and the waters beat up on the ship, and they saw Jesus sleep, they got upset at Jesus because he was asleep. Because they were convinced in their mind that they would perish. Forgetting the word of God that Jesus had spoken that they were going to the other side. I'm telling you saints, if God said you're going to the other side, you're going to the other side. If God said you're coming out of this, you're coming out of this. If God saved you, ha, ah, praise God. Born again of the water and the spirit. He has invested into you. He will not let you die without purpose. Amen. Praise God. We don't have to fear. We don't have to panic. What we do have to do is find Jesus in the storm. And Jesus will sleep. <laughs> what you find Jesus doing is a probably good idea just to go do what he's doing. Like the Lord's sleeping, maybe I shouldn't be tripping. And he rose up, and then they found out a revelation. There's some storms that God has the power to stop. Which means there's some stuff you're going through, you don't have to. Let me let that sink in for a second. There's some storm. Now, Job couldn't stop his. It was just happening. But some stuff, you don't got to go through. Some pains and headaches and situations and circumstances you don't got to go to. You can, you can, peace be still. And, whew, stop. Storm in your mind stops. How many have storms in your mind? Storms in your mind stops. Depression, storms in your mind. Mental illness, storms right up here in your mind. Storms and situations and circumstances. All hell breaks loose in your life. Going through a storm. The revelation is this. Yeah, they, they feared, but at least they got to Jesus. Which shows us if we can get to Jesus, there's some stuff we don't got to go through. Oh, if I can wake him up and get him get, get his attention for this current situation right here, he don't have to go through it. And I've experienced that from There's been some storms I've went through in my life. Oh, Jesus. I had nowhere else to turn to, nowhere else to go. And I, all the thing I knew to do, bro, was just come to church and get down to these altars and just weep and cry before God. And I'm sure Jesus was probably looking at me the same way he looked at these disciples. Oh, ye of little faith, why are you so, I don't care. Let this, this peace be still, Jesus. Come on. <laughs> you call me a punk if you want to. I ain't going through this storm no more. Praise God. <laughs> look, look, you know, all you brothers are sitting here hard. You better learn how to cry before God. You better learn how to let out all your emotions. Don't let them out to your kids or to your wife. You go before the Lord and boo-hoo and cry your eyes out. You got to yell at somebody, go yell at God. Get his attention because at least he has an ability to do something about it. If I can find Jesus in the storm, I might be able to find peace in the storm. I might be able to find calm in the storm. And he might be able to just stop the storm altogether and show me that if I can just get a hold of you, praise God, uh, peace be still. What I'm going through, I don't have to go through it no more. Ah, praise God. Some storms we don't have to suffer. We can just find our help in the storm, which is Jesus. No matter how much water you're taking on, find Jesus. No matter how bad the waves are beating up on the ship, just go ahead and find Jesus. No matter how sick you are, find Jesus. Go and wake him up. Cry unto him and get his attention. Wail even in your unbelief. And God will answer. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. It's one storm. There's another storm that comes with his disciples. All of the disciples, now the multitudes didn't go through this. The disciples did. Matthew chapter 14. 
Verse 22, the Bible says, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side. Here we go again. You ever think once you've been through something, that that's it, Lord? I'm not going through nothing more. Lord, okay, Lord, I did it once. We're good. <laughs> Lord's like, nope. <laughs> Got another one coming. <laughs> sent the multitudes away, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, the context of this is not immediately obvious in the scriptures is that seven, at least seven of those disciples were fishermen and they spent a lot of time on the water. Lots of time, that was their business. So these weren't men that were just a little seasick. These were experienced fishermen that would have no doubt have endured storms before. So if these guys are scared, it's a storm. It's nothing to, it's nothing to shake a stick at. This is something serious here. And so verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. For the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch, that's the darkest part of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Middle of the night. If you've ever seen a sea, waves are like, you know, 9, 10, 11, 15 feet tall. And the whole ship is being thrown around by these waves. There's some storms that can sink a cruise liner. This And, and the Lord's out there just... What is happening here? Jesus is walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit. And they cried out for fear, 100%. Because if I see somebody out on a boat walking in the midst of a turbulent storm, I'm going to be like, that's a ghost. Ghosts are real. <laughs> and they, were, they were scared. But Jesus spoke unto them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. See, y'all thought it was just Jesus that walked on water. It was Peter walking to Jesus too. So Jesus is out there just, and Peter's out there, oh, Lord, I'm coming. Give me that type of faith. Verse 30, but when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Second storm the disciples in was different from the first. In the last storm, Jesus was clearly with them on the boat. But this storm, Jesus leaves them in the boat with nothing but a word. I'll meet you on the other side. There's some storms you're going to go into, Jesus is going to be clearly right there with you. There are other storms you're going to go through, you're going to have to hang on to nothing but the word of God. It doesn't mean that the boat's not going to be tossed around. It doesn't mean you're not going to go through trials and tribulations or problems, but Jesus is not going to be clearly there visibly. You're going to have to hang on to his word. But in both of these storms, he ended up making himself present. In this storm, the ship began to be tossed by the waves. And the Bible said again, the wind was contrary. Praise God. Too many times we give up because of a contrary wind. Because things aren't going your way, you think it's not the will of God. Because you face a little bit of opposition, you give up. And we say things like, well, if it was meant to happen, it would just happen. No, it won't just happen. Sometimes the wind is going to be contrary to what the direction that God wants you to go in. And it is the will of God for you to keep going through this contrary wind. 
Because if you've got a mind made up, not even the contrary wind can stop the will of God. It turns out we need to hang on to the promises of God. That he said, I'll meet you on the other side. Praise God. All of a sudden, they see Jesus in the storm. Except this time, he's not asleep in the ship. It's the darkest part of the night. The darkest part of your affliction. The most troublesome part of your circumstance. The most painful part of your situation. Jesus shows up right in the midst of it. But he's not with you. He's rising above it. He's not in it with you. He has transcended what you're going through. Praise God. And then they were scared and Jesus said, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Jesus is found walking on the water. But not only is he walking on the water, there is an open invitation for anybody that is sick of going through the current turbulence of this storm to get out of it and transcend it in this situation. This is probably the most common type of storm that I find myself facing. These are not the storms that Jesus just delivers me out of. These are not the storms where he comes and says, peace be still. These are not the storms where the wind and the waves stop beating and the storm stops raining. And the pain just disappears and the headache goes away and the frustration stops. No, those storms are not the frequent ones. These are the frequent storms. Where in this storm, nothing is going to stop until I find Jesus. He's not going to stop the pain. He's not going to stop the wind. He's not going to stop the waves. He's not going to keep the boat from rocking. But what he will offer you is a temporary escape to transcend everything that you're going through. My Bible tells me to be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Make your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, God will not deliver you from every storm. God will not calm every storm. God will not save you out, but he can give you peace in the middle of turbulence. He can give you a sure word in the middle of uncertainty. Oh, praise God. He can give you hope in the middle of hopelessness. Hallelujah. He can restore your faith in the middle of fear. He can be the light in the darkest of situation. But it's our responsibility to say, Lord, I'm getting out of the boat and I'm walking over to you. God does not go stop every storm, but he wants you to walk above some of them. Ha, ah, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Walk above the waves. Walk above the boat. Walk above the disappointment. Come on. Walk above that depression. Get out of it. We, oh, Jesus. We're walking above it. Hallelujah. Being sustained by nothing but the power of God. Not everybody goes there, though. We're scared. And it doesn't seem possible that I can be going through hell and high water and still have joy. That I can be going through my worst situation, lose all my kids, my money, my livelihood, and almost my wife, and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I believe Joel had a hold of something. God didn't heal his disease. He didn't take the pain away. He just said, I got you. Saints, it's time for us to find Jesus. Find him. I know you're going through hell and high water. Find Jesus. Your help is in the storm. Your help, and the storm's coming. The purpose was never really the storm in the first place. The purpose was always you. It was always to give them a revelation of who Jesus was. Because when he got back in the boat with them, they said, of a surely you're the son of God. They found that out in a storm. So I'm telling you today, it's time for us to find Jesus. 
If you're going through hell and high water today, God is here for you. He loves you. If we can get, get to him, he'll either stop the storm or help you to walk above that junk. Hallelujah, Jesus. But I want to take us further than that. Here's a question I want us to ask. Why? What are you trying to show me in this storm? Are you trying to show me something about myself? Are you trying to reveal my own fear? My own lack of faith? Are you trying to show me that my house is not built on the foundation that I thought it was? Are you trying to show me that I'm not as committed as I thought I was? God, what are you trying to show me in this storm? Because it's not about the storm. Not even about how bad it is. It's about getting you to him. Jesus. What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to show me about you in this storm? Maybe God wants to show you that he's the healer. He's the way maker. He's your provider, not the job. Maybe that's what he's trying to show you. Oh, help me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Because the sooner you begin to seek that revelation, the quicker we can get out this current storm. Oh, praise God. Let's all stand here today. I'm closing. I know I preach long today. I don't normally preach 40, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 49 minutes, 50, 55, going once, going twice. Amen. Saints, we're here for a purpose today. I hope you didn't come here just to hear me. I hope you come here to find Jesus. If you're going through a storm today, Three categories of people here. All of us are going through something. You're either going through a storm that God wants to speak to and tell it to stop. You're going through a storm that God's not stopping no way. But he'll help you to come above it. Or there's a storm coming to show you what foundation you're built on. Which one are you today? Which one are you today? And all of them, the answer is Jesus. If you're in here today and you've never received the Holy Ghost, God will pour out his spirit upon you today. The Bible says you must be born again of water and spirit if we want to enter into the kingdom of God. If you're in here today and you've already been saved, but your, little, your walk with God is a little shaky. That's why the storm is here, to get you back on track. If you're in here today and you don't know why you're going through what you're going through because of Job, Job situation. God's here for you today as well. To give you peace and pass up all understanding. Now, if you're, oh, if you're cool with your storm, then rock on with your bad stuff. But I need God. I need God. Open up these altars today, and I encourage you to come. I encourage you to come. We're going to touch Jesus today. We're going to find him today. That's how we find him. We find him in prayer. We find him the same way Peter found him when he was drowning. He cried out, said, Lord, save me. We find him the same way the disciples found him in the midst of the ship. They cried out and said, Care thou not that we perish. We need to lift up our voices today and cry out to God and say, Lord, here I am. Come on, let's begin to pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, <laughs> that you called us out of darkness into marvelous light, that you called us here today even, Lord God. Father, we have we need you, Lord Jesus. I need you to step in to this place. I need you to step in to every situation. I need you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Even though our lifestyles have shown that we think we don't need you, God, we need you today. We're done running, Lord God. We don't have the strength to handle this on our own, Lord. We don't have the power to handle this on our own, Father, so we need you today. Lord, and we repent right now, God, of all sin, Lord God. All iniquity, oh God. Everything we've said or done or left undone, Father, I pray a prayer of repentance today. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to find it today, Lord. Grant it to us, Lord. Lord, and I pray, oh God, that you call every open heart right now, God, back to a place of intimacy with you, Lord. Help us not just to be hearers of your word, but help us to do it, Lord. For if we don't do it, Lord God, it's not going to profit us anything, Lord. Father, I pray today, oh God, that you, Lord, would begin to pour out your spirit today, Lord God. 
Begin to release the Holy Ghost into this place right now, God, over every empty vessel, Lord. Every person that has not received the Holy Ghost, Father, it is your will to receive them, O oh God, and to save them. I pray that you begin to do it right now, God. Lord, and I pray right now, God, for the peace that passeth all understanding, Lord, to begin today to keep our hearts and minds in you, Lord Jesus. For we need you today, O oh God. We cannot do this on our own, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for every storm, Lord God, that is in this place that you begin to speak to it, Lord God. Speak to the storm, Lord God. Say, peace be still, Lord God. I pray today, Lord God, for every afflicted mind, Lord God. Oh God, everyone struggling with depression, Lord God. Anyone struggling with anxiety, Lord God. I pray, oh God, that you would speak peace into their mind, Lord. As they cry out to you this morning, Lord God, speak peace into their situation, Lord. I pray for those, oh God, that are struggling with uncertainty, Lord God. Lord God, I pray that you, oh God, would speak peace, Lord God, into their situation. Help them, Lord God, to rest and try on you, oh God. Lord God, I pray today, Lord God, for every mental illness and affliction, Lord God, that you would cause it to flee today, oh God. I pray for every physical affliction in our bodies, Lord God. We know you, Father, is a healer today, Lord God, so I speak a healing, Lord God, over every afflicted body up here, Lord God, over every sickness, Lord God. I pray, Father, that you speak to that storm today, Lord God, and let it be healed, oh God. Lord, we believe you today and trust you, Lord God, that you, Lord God, will deliver us, Lord God, that you, Lord God, will save us, Lord God. We cry out to you, Lord God, for salvation today, Lord God, and pray, oh God, oh, you're so terrible, Lord Jesus, oh God. That you pull us out, Lord God. That you be our help in this time of trouble, Lord God. That you, Lord God, would be our joy, oh God. That you would be our strength, Lord. That you would be our comfort, oh God. That you, Lord God, would be our help, Lord God. And Father, we choose today, oh God, to lift you up in glory, in honor, and in praise. Regardless, oh God, of anything that we go through, Lord God, we will bless you at all times, oh God. And your praises shall continually be on our lips, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we lift you up today. In Jesus' name.